Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare. Leave is granted. Senator Payne. I move that the Senate records its deep sorrow at the death on 26 February 2021 of Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samare, the first and longest serving Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. Places on record its acknowledgement of his central role in Papua New Guinea's development, including of its national constitution, and tenders its profound sympathy to his family and to the people of Papua New Guinea in their bereavement. Papa Lo Country. As well as bearing the title of Grand Chief, Sir Michael Samare was, rightly, known as Father of the Nation. Sir Michael was the principal architect of Papua New Guinea's smooth and peaceful independence from Australia in 1975. He served his country throughout his life, including as Papua New Guinea's first Prime Minister and then as Prime Minister on several other occasions, including the longest period between 2002 and 2011. He also served in other ways, including several periods as Leader of the Opposition, through to his eventual retirement from politics just four years ago in 2017. As the nation's first and longest serving Prime Minister, the Grand Chief has an unparalleled place in Papua New Guinean history and in Pacific history. His contribution to peaceful order and growth in the Pacific was widely appreciated across the region. He worked with Australia and with leaders from across the region from the 1970s through to the 2010s, helping to build the peaceful region of which we are a part today. The early development and successes of the South Pacific Forum, now the Pacific Islands Forum, owed much to the firm friendship that Sir Michael built with Ratu Mara, Fiji's founding Prime Minister. His contribution touched every aspect of Papua New Guinea's transition to full sovereignty, from helping to shape Papua New Guinea's constitution, to launching its economic independence, to fostering the creative arts in celebration of Papua New Guinea's rich and diverse culture. I was honoured to see this firsthand in one of my visits to Papua New Guinea. In 2018, I attended the reopening of the National Museum and Gallery with Sir Michael and Lady Veronica. The gallery, 44 years ago, was his vision. He wanted it to be an intensely Indigenous institution, a centre for cultural activity, identity and knowledge. So our work with Papua New Guinea to refurbish the gallery is a very strong reminder of the, the emphasis that Australia places on Papua New Guinea's culture and diversity and the emphasis that I know he wanted to see. As you walk through that gallery, Mr President, and I have said this to many people, as you walk through that gallery, it is one of the most extraordinary series of exhibits of regional culture that I have ever seen. It is spellbinding. You view it in silence, but in wonder at the complexity and diversity of the culture laid out across the gallery. That was his vision. That was his leadership. And we played a small part in bringing that back to the people of Papua New Guinea in 2018. Sir Michael was dedicated to his family as a loyal husband and father. And I want to extend my personal condolences to his daughter, Dulce Samare, whom I know personally uh, on this great loss. As a loving son, Sir Michael talked publicly about his own father's advice to him about the magic of peace, saying that every clan has its own special magic and ours is the magic of peace. He was also a conciliator. In 1975, on the cusp of Papua New Guinea's independence, Sir Michael wrote in his autobiography that, and I quote, when people come to fight us, we will call them to eat first, unquote. We sit down together, we talk, we eat, he wrote, 
Then we say to them, all right, if you want to fight, take your spears and stand over there. We also will take our weapons and we'll stand on this side. The effect of this magic on those interlocutors was profound. By the end of the 1960s and into the early 1970s, there was bipartisan support in Australia for Papua New Guinea's self-determination. Prime Minister Gough Whitlam, Prime Minister when Papua New Guinea became a sovereign nation, acknowledged former Foreign Minister Andrew Peacock's key role in the process as Minister for External Territories in 1972. No transition to political independence is easy. In the early 1970s, Papua New Guinea faced major political, economic and separatist challenges. Sir Michael's gifts as a consensus builder, an inspirational leader and a fierce believer in his people were essential to the peacefulness of PNG's transition. His dedication to public service and national unity helped to create the vibrant and unbroken democracy that Papua New Guinea has been since independence. Australia has a strong relationship with an independent and sovereign Papua New Guinea, thanks to the groundwork Sir Michael laid for an enduring friendship between our countries. Sir Michael was generous, full of energy and time. He was a model for leadership. In doing all of these things and so much more, Sir Michael spread the magic that his father taught him. Papa Blow Country. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I rise on behalf of the Australian Labor Party to express our condolences following the passing of former Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samara, at the age of 84. Mr. President, throughout the histories of nations, there are those who are icons, giants, to their people look to, who lead them through struggles, who help them see who they are and what they can be, and the people of Papua New Guinea have lost one of theirs. And I offer my party's condolences, not just to Lady Veronica and his families and friends, but to all the people of Papua New Guinea on the passing of Sir Michael Samare. Papa Blok Country, Father of the Nation, Grand Chief, and their first Prime Minister, whose leadership spanned decades, and the premierships of Whitlam, Fraser, Hawke, Howard, Rudd, and Gillard. He served as Prime Minister on three occasions, from 1975 to 1980, from 1982 to 1985, and from 2002 until 2012. In the latter period, I did have the opportunity to meet the Grand Chief as Minister for Climate Change as the Rudd government engaged deeply with Papua New Guinea on climate change and deforestation. Sir Michael Samara's campaign to lead his people into, into independence coincided with Gough Whitlam and Labor's determination to end Australian colonialism and to deliver self-government to the people of Papua New Guinea. Prime Minister Whitlam made that, uh, well, Mr Whitlam made that clear on visits there as opposition leader in 1970 and 1971. Indeed, Gough Whitlam wanted to see self-government within a year of coming into office and full independence within his first term, and give or take a few months, that's what happened. At the same time, it was Michael Samari with his Pungu party seeking to unite the people of Papua New Guinea in a campaign for independence. He said, a lot of people in this country thought we wouldn't be able to do it. They were talking in terms of two or three decades, whilst I was talking in terms of two years. With some comparability to his own experience, Gough Whitlam once said, Sir Michael's country had found a man whose time had come. Sir Michael was the son of a police officer who bore the tribal name Sunna, a name he would later take himself. It is not insignificant that it is a tribal name which means peacemaker. And the values to which he was exposed in early life as his father carried out these dual roles in cultural and secular leadership would stay with him throughout his political career. His first vocation was in teaching, a role that then again took him, that again took him to different regions across Papua New Guinea. This evolved into a career in journalism and broadcasting, something that would bring with it his first forays into politics. He attended the Administrative College in Port Moresby, which was designed to build the skills of the local population to serve in the Australian colonial administration. But it also had the effect of bringing together individuals who shared a vision of a new nation, 
a nation that would govern itself, a nation not subservient to a foreign master. Somewhat unwittingly, colonial Australia did build the training ground for the leaders of Papua New Guinea's independence movement, and that is a good thing. Momentum towards independence for PNG, Papua New Guinea, was building throughout the 60s and into the early 70s. After little progress under Australian colonial rule for half a century, international pressure be began to come to bear and there was an acceleration through this period as there was in many other parts of the world. Sir Michael Samari was one of many energetic, young, idealistic and nationalistic individuals who were ready to bring the curtain down on Australian administration. They came together, they organised politically, and Sir Michael's union background helped him to connect with other movement participants of which he soon became a preeminent leader. At the same time, of course, Gough Whitlam was modernising Labor and preparing to modernise Australia, including an end to the era of colonisation. Leaving his public service job to successfully contest the second elections for the House of Assembly in 1968, that's the year I was born, Mr President, um, Sir Michael entered Parliament representing East Sepik and succeeded to the leadership of Pungu Party. He became a key figure in the preparations for independence and in the preparation and adoption of the new constitution for the new country. So whilst Sir Michael did not arrive with independence, independence arrived with Sir Michael. Recognising the importance of bringing people with him, and with the movement for independence as a whole, as well as tempering the urgency with which some wanted to move, he engaged carefully across the nation and across, the, across peoples. This included travelling to the highlands and villages to talk directly with more conservative tribal leaders. For Sir Michael, independence was the goal, but he recognised it had to be in keeping with Papua New Guinea's traditions and had to be de delivered organically, peacefully, and, and most importantly, in a culturally unifying way. Former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd has reflected, Sir Michael was not just a disruptor, but he helped to build a new status quo, helped to steer his nation through the heady days of independence and beyond. Having successfully delivered independence peacefully as the country's first Prime Minister, Sir Michael had to make it stick. It was no foregone conclusion that the new nation would be a success, particularly considering its diversity of tribal groups. Papua New Guinea was described by Sir Michael as a melting pot of tribes, clans and families that were never meant to be the same. So of course, as always, the role of leadership in those early years was pivotal. Sir Michael helped to build a nation that saw the strengths that lay in its traditional culture and diversity as sources of unity and common ground rather than as sources of potential fracture and disharmony. Regrettably, Papua New Guinea today is not without serious struggles. Too few children complete school. Too many women are subjected to family violence. And preventable disease still has a devastating impact on the population. And as we speak, the worsening outbreak of COVID-19 poses a grave threat. But it is a country that has made its transition to independence in peace and in optimism, a legacy that is Sir Michael's as much as anybody's, and a legacy in which Labor will always be proud, which Labor will always be proud to have supported. Ronald J. May of the Department of Pacific Affairs at the ANU noted, Papua New Guinea remains one of a fairly small number of post-colonial states that have maintained an unbroken record of democracy. It has managed to maintain the spirit that characterised its transition to independence. Best described by Papua New Guinea's first Governor General when he said in 1975, we are lowering the flag of our colonisers, not tearing it down. Of course, it was only a few months later that Sir Michael joked following the dismissal of the Whitlam government, we've only let Australia go a few months and look at the mess they're in. <laughs> Sir Michael Samari, died on February in February 2021. Papua New Guinea and the wider Pacific has, with his passing, lost one of its most prominent and respected leaders. In his last address to the parliament in 2017, Sir Michael said, we progressed through many waves and changes in the world. We survived our own bad decisions. We have united at times when the world thought it was not possible to do so. We must be thankful 
and we must always count our blessings. All these things are true, and they are in large part true because of Sir Michael's, Michael's stewardship. The opposition again expresses our deep condolences to the people of Papua New Guinea and to Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare's family and his loved ones. Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, it's an honour to say a few words uh, to support this condolence motion today on the passing uh, of Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare, Papua New Guinea's first Prime Minister. And can I say it was an honour to represent uh, the government at the very moving memorial service uh, that was held uh, in the High Commission uh, here in Canberra uh, over the weekend. Uh, as Minister for International Development in the Pacific, uh, I'm acutely aware of how significant Sir Michael's leadership of Papua New Guinea was, including for Australia, uh, Australia's relationship with our region. In the 1960s and 70s, uh, as Sir Michael Samare was emerging politically and growing in his influence, questions of self-determination and democracy were at the heart of national affairs in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guineans wanted independence and Australia too wanted PNG to emerge as a successful independent nation. At such a time, the emergence of political self-determination could have happened in a number of different ways. Uh, in so many countries, independence was won through violence. Fortunately, as we know, a determined and charismatic Sir Michael Samare uh, guided PNG along an entirely peaceful path, and an independent, sovereign nation emerged in 1975. The Australian flag was respectfully lowered in PNG, not torn down. It is to Sir Michael's enduring credit that he managed to forge not just unity of PNG's diverse peoples, but simultaneously presided over the negotiation of an enduring political compact with Australia. Our two countries work together on independence and have continued to partner on securing a sustainable and sovereign path of development for PNG. Sir Michael's successes in building consensus and building relationships across the region meant that he developed strong ties with successive Australian governments and leaders, from Gough Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser through to Bob Hawke and John Howard and uh, Prime Ministers Rudd and Gillard. Australia's relationship with Papua New Guinea under Sir Michael Samare in his successive terms as Prime Minister set the tenor for Australia's broader engagement with the Pacific. Sir Michael came to symbolise PNG's independence movement, uh, but he also ensured that its independence was more than symbolic. His enduring focus was on PNG's ability to forge a unique national identity, govern independently and sustain itself economically. At the point of independence, Australian financial support for Papua New Guinea was significant. Of course it was, since PNG had been in Australian territory for several decades. But neither side wanted a long-term relationship of financial dependence. And under Sir Michael's stewardship and that of subsequent PNG leaders, PNG has indeed built its economy and developed its self-reliance. Guided by PNG's priorities as a sovereign nation, Australia continues to provide a helping hand. But we do so in ways that Sir Michael Samare helped establish. We do so as peers, sovereign, independent and free, but linked fundamentally by our past, our present and our future. Right through to 2021, in the continuing COVID era, our partnership with PNG seeks to enhance health security, deepen economic sustainability and strengthen regional stability. We continue to champion self-determination and locally driven decision-making throughout the Pacific, just as we did in 1975. Self-determination, consensus building, respectful partnerships to advance security, prosperity and stability in the Pacific. This is a legacy that Sir Michael has helped bequeath to Australia's relationships with our nearest neighbours. In closing, uh, I'd like to recognise Sir Michael's family, uh, Lady Veronica and their children and grandchildren. Most profoundly, I acknowledge with gratitude the extraordinary contribution Sir Michael Samare made to the tradition of peaceful, peaceful cooperation that binds the Pacific today. May he rest in peace. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak on this condolence motion 
and to pay my respects to the father of Papua New Guinea Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare. In doing so, I want to associate myself with the remarks of Senator Wong and, uh, in contributing to this important motion, recognise the close relationship between Papua New Guinea and Queensland and the very close and customary relationship between the sovereign people of the Torres Strait and PNG. In his time as Chief Minister and then as Prime Minister, Sir Michael, in his important role in the independence of PNG, has always understood and valued the relationship between Papua New Guinea and Queensland. The state of Queensland and Papua New Guinea share more than an international border. Sir Michael remarked in 2008 that the connection extended to his own education. He was educated by Queensland teachers under the Queensland curriculum. It extended even to the sugar crop in Queensland, which he is rely was reliably told uh, originally came from Papua New Guinea. So Michael lived a life of service to his people and to a nation. As a vice president of the Public Service Association, he spoke up on local wages and working conditions of local workers. He helped launch the School of Broadcasting in Port Moresby. But it was independence and the transformation of Papua New Guinea to the youthful, modern and proud nation that it is today that was Sir Michael's life's work. Bringing people together, uniting a nation against the odds. In 2008, Sir Michael delivered a, an historic address at a sitting of the Queensland Parliament in Cairns. It was the first time an invitation of that kind had been offered to the Papua New Guinean Prime Minister and, as he remarked at the time, was an occasion fitting the recognition of the importance we both attach to our relationship and to the long and extensive links that have prevailed between our two peoples. Sir Michael told the parliament, relations between Papua New Guinea and Queensland are indeed the most extensive of all relations with other Australian states. The challenge for us is to ensure that the res reservoir of goodwill that exists between our peoples is exploited to the fullest to deepen our relationship and grow our respective economies. These challenges remain today. Right now, we face the challenge of responding to the coronavirus pandemic together. In the future, we will face many more challenges. The way we face those challenges will always be informed by the deep affection and reverence our nation and the far north Queensland community has for the father of PNG. The Torres Strait Islands and PNG share more than an international border. They share customs and kinship. The Torres Strait Treaty, signed by Sir Michael and Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser in 1978, is recognised as one of the most creative solutions in international law. It uniquely aims to maintain the lives and livelihoods, the traditions and family life between the people living within the Torres Strait protected zone. Families live across these islands and you can almost reach out and touch the villages from the shore of another. Because of this closeness and the treaty which Sir Michael authored, we are not two countries or two people, we are family. And so we grieve with the nation of Papua New Guinea for the loss of, of your Grand Chief, not simply as a partner in the Pacific, but as family. As a sign of the close connection between not only our two countries, but of the regions of Papua New Guinea and uh, far north Queensland, of the four memorials for Sir Michael being held in Australia, one of those memorials will be held in Cairns later this week. That memorial service will be held this Thursday, the 18th of March, at St Monica's Cathedral on Abbott Street in Cairns. And on that occasion, the many people from Papua New Guinea living in Cairns and the people connected to the Torres Strait will have the opportunity to grieve and commemorate a great life. I extend my condolences to Lady Victoria and the entire Samare family. Thank you. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we are proud as a nation to say that uh, as a, a Commonwealth and as a Federation, we are a young nation. And compared to our Indigenous peoples in the old wor world, yes, we are young. 
But still, as one of the oldest democracies in the world, Australia has assisted a number of nations, not just in our region, but across the world, to either attain a form of democratic government or to sustain that form against internal problems and external aggression. Australia has a proud record of doing so, and one of the main agencies for doing so has been the Australian Defence Force under the direction of government. One of our nearest neighbours, Mr President, is Papua New Guinea. Its road to independence has been long and hard, and the person we are here to commemorate today, Sir Michael Samari, played a major role in that process and has deep links to Australia. The eastern half of the island of, of, of New Guinea has been ruled by three external powers since 1884. Germany ruled the north of the island beginning that year, calling it German New Guinea, and the United Kingdom colonised the southern half in the same year, calling it British New Guinea then transferred that portion to Australian administration in 1905. At the outbreak of World War I, Australia took the northern half of the island from Germany in the only truly independent military action ever conducted by Australia, that is, without being in a coalition with other nations. After World War I, Australia administered the northern and southern half of the eastern side of the island separately until 1949. World War II broke on PNG with violence and suffering. The size of the catastrophe for the local Melanesian people has never been uh, measured, but the interruption to their lifestyle, their local subsistence economy and the introduction of disease and conscript labour could be measured perhaps by the fact that well over 200,000 Japanese, Australian and US soldiers fighting uh, died in the fighting in PNG. So the impact on the local people must have been immeasurable. As we know, the two territories were combined after World War II into the territory of PNG. This was the nation into which Sir Michael Samari was born. So we rise today to offer our condolences on the death of Sir Michael Samari, the first Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, when the nation gained independence from Australia in 1975. Sir Michael Samari grew up in East Sepik Province first attending school there during the Japanese occupation. Sir Michael became a teacher, teaching at several schools, returning to Sagari for further training from 1962 to 63. He was interested in politics early in the development of his nation and was co-founder of the pro-independence Pangu Party in 1967. In 1968, he became the first official opposition leader in the fledgling PNG parliament. In 1972, when PNG achieved self-government, Sir Michael became the first Chief Minister and then PNG's first Prime Minister in 1975, when the nation achieved its independence. It was at this stage, Mr President, that my life and that of PNG and very briefly Sir Michael Samari became mildly interconnected. My first posting on graduating from the Royal Military College in December 1971 was to Papua New Guinea. I was sent there as a Lieutenant Infantry Platoon Commander in the 1st Battalion of the Pacific Island Regiment for three years, half in Port Moresby and half in Ley. My job was to command 30 PNG soldiers as one of the last Australian lieutenants to be sent to PNG, as all young lieutenants who arrived after I did were all Papua New Guineans. Our function was not only to lead and train the PNG soldiers to provide security to the process of self-government and independence backing up the police in internal security, but also to assist in building the nation of PNG. This last duty involved what was called patrolling, which was walking, carrying very heavy packs, often with local white key apps or civilian administrators, through the hills and mountains, swamps and rivers of PNG, as my father and uncles did during World War II, for eight months of each of the three years I was posted to PNG, and to tell the villagers along the route that there was a country called PNG and they were it. I might have made some small contribution to the stability of PNG during self-government independence, but that country and the PNG people taught me much more about myself as a person, a leader and a soldier than I could ever remember, and for that I will always be grateful. I met Sir Michael during that period on several occasions, none of which he would ever have remembered. Probably the strangest was when I played representative Australian rules football for PNG against a visiting representative Australian Aboriginal team, all Victorian Football League VFL players as ruck. 
We lined up in the centre of the main Port Moresby Stadium to be personally greeted by Sir Michael. Apart from the umpire, I was the only white man on the field and stood considerably taller than most PNG players. And Sir Michael, moving along the line of players, shaking all our hands, had to significantly lift his gaze and his handshake when he came to me. He may also have noticed that I played appallingly on that day and PNG lost. I was lucky enough to see up close the remarkable change in this, that this society of PNG went through from when I was a lieutenant and on many visits back to PNG until I, I went back as a general many years later. PNG has had many stumbles as a nation, as we all do as our nations develop, but in all those visits I was able to see how Sir Michael inspired and led his people. Apart from being a key figure in the independence negotiations, and in the preparation and adoption of a constitution, the single most difficult task that one could ever imagine. So Michael was the first and longest serving Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. He served either in government or as a senior statesman through political crises, natural disasters, economic trials, rebellion, conflict and constitutional challenges. He was honoured by being made a Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St Michael and St George by the Queen in the birthday honours list in 1990. He is often referred to by his people as Grand Chief or the Father of the Nation, titles earned through those three separate terms as Prime Minister, totalling 17 years leading the nation. Mr President, the nation of PNG, our closest neighbour and of the greatest importance to this country in the rapidly changing strategic environment facing our region, will miss the advice and leadership of Sir Michael Samari, as will many Australian leaders and many of my generation who served in PNG. I offer my condolences to the people of PNG. May Sir Michael Samari rest in peace and may the nation he led, of which he was the father, prosper in his absence. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I am deeply honoured to speak on this condolence motion in relation to the path, passing of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Samara. And if I could say to my friend, the Senator from New South Wales, that it should be recognised that Sir Michael was a devout Blues supporter. <laughs> and there were occasions when political leaders from Queensland visited Papua New Guinea and sought to present uh, Sir Michael with a Maroons jumper and were quickly disabused of the notion that Sir Michael could possibly support other team but the Blues or other codes, indeed, uh, indeed, Senator. It was in the period between 1999 and 2001 when I lived and worked in Papua New Guinea, and as part of that process, I sat the Papua New Guinea law exams. And there were three law exams I had to sit, constitutional law, customary law and land law. And it was reading the history of the development of PNG's constitution that I developed a deep abiding respect for Sir Michael Samare. I can remember in the year 2000 when PNG was celebrating the 25th anniversary of its independence that there was a lot of discussion with respect to uh, the journey to independence and where PNG had gotten up to at that stage after 25 years. And I always reminded my friends in Australia that PNG had gone on a fantastic, momentous journey to independence. It was still a functioning democracy. It still had rule of law. It still had free press, and it still does to this day. And in that year 2000, there was actually an Olympic torch relay. And senators here might not realise that the Olympic torch, as it made its way to Sydney, actually went through Papua New Guinea. And the penultimate holder of the torch during that relay was the great Melbourne storm winger, Marcus Bai, in keeping with uh, PNG's esteem for the great game of rugby league, the greatest game of all. But the last, the last holder of the torch, and I can picture Sir Michael with the torch uh, as I deliver this uh, speech, was Sir Michael Zamare and, and the joy with which he took that torch as he handed it on to those who were going to take it to the Sydney Olympics. I think in reflecting on Sir Michael's contribution to the independent state of Papua New Guinea, we should carefully have regard to the events of 1980. In my view, 
This was a key moment in the history of Papua New Guinea. Sir Michael, who was the sitting Prime Minister in the time leading up to, in, to the year 1980, had been the subject of three no-confidence motions in the floor of parliament in Papua New Guinea. Now, no-confidence motions in the floor of parliament in Papua New Guinea are not a rare thing. They are not a rare thing, and politics in PNG is extraordinarily robust. And Sir Michael had successfully defeated the first three no-confidence resolutions. But in 1980, he succumbed to one. He lost one. So the father of the nation, the first prime minister, had lost a motion of no-confidence on the floor of parliament. And what did Sir Michael do? He respected the decision of the parliament he respected the democratic process and he stood aside for the next prime minister and that was a key a key point where papua new guinea demonstrated that instead of going the way of some post colonial nations where they embraced dictatorship despotism and turned their back on democracy png would not take that path and indeed sir michael successfully contested the next election where his Pangu party made a storming uh, election win. Now, a storming election win in Papua New Guinea context was 51 seats out of 109, about 34 per cent of the vote. And that's a huge win in Papua New Guinea's first past the post system. So Sir Michael respected legal and democratic processes deeply. He carried no rancor or hubris in relation to the discharge of his deeply held responsibilities. And he was well respected by all of the people of Papua New Guinea, including the people of Bougainville, including the people of Bougainville, even during the times of great difficulty in that regard. Now, Sir Michael, notwithstanding the fact that he was a blue supporter, did have a close connection to Queensland. And I'd like to uh, tell at least two stories in that regard. I'm informed by uh, a friend of mine who was uh, head of uh, a PNG Students Association at the University of Queensland, that on one occasion Sir Michael presented himself to a bank in Queen Street in Brisbane to convert some Kina into Australian currency. And the bank teller uh, advised him that Sir Michael would have to show identification before she could convert the currency, in, in response to which Sir Michael duly presented the 50 Kina, dollar, 50 Kina note and said, that's me, Sir Michael Samare. I think he got his Australian dollars. Sir Michael was also known to go to horse races in, uh, in Brisbane and really enjoyed that spirit of freedom he could have in a Brisbane context where he didn't need a security detail. He was just another race goer enjoying the day. Finally, Mr President, I'll just note, and I was reflecting on this over the weekend, that perhaps the events of Sir Michael's final journey from Port Moresby to his final resting place in Weewak say all you need to know about the regard in which Sir Michael was held by the Papua New Guinean people and also about its relationship with Australia. So when Sir Michael's casket was taken to PNG Airport, the uh, attendants attempted to load it into the Air New Guinea flight to go to Weewak and the casket wouldn't fit. And so the attendants proposed to put the casket in the hold of the Air New Guinea flight. In response to that, the many hundreds and hundreds of Papua New Guineans present watching this journey revolted. This could not occur. Their founding father, Sir Michael Samare, could not suffer the indignity of being held in the hold of a cargo of an Air New Guinea flight on his final journey to WeeWAC. And so what was the solution? Well, the Australian RAAF provided a transport plane after some negotiations with the Samare family and also with the protesters. It was agreed that that plane would collect Sir Michael and deliver it with dignity and honour back to WeeWAC. And that, Mr President, in my view, says everything you need to know about the special relationship between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Long may it be so.
Senator Firavanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as a former Minister for International Development in the Pacific, I too would like to add my condolences to the family of Sir Michael Samare and to the people of Papua New Guinea on his passing. Um, I would like to associate myself with the comments that have been made uh, by my colleagues and most especially, I think, Senator Scar, your anecdotes about uh, Sir Michael just really demonstrate uh, the close relationship that Australia has uh, with Papua New Guinea and on so many uh, different fronts. And I have to say that I always enjoyed my visits uh, to Papua New Guinea, uh, but uh, most especially um, my interaction uh, with the people of Papua and New Guinea. Um, let's not forget that the stability, security and prosperity of the region is second uh, for Australia, second only to the defence of Australia. And I think that when you do look uh, at uh, the history of Papua New Guinea and what has been relayed to us uh, in relation to the history of Sir Michael a Samari as Grand Chief and father of the nation. I know that Sir, Ma uh, Sir Michael uh, contributed very much to the stability, the security and the prosperity, not just of his own country, but in turn to the region. And I know that many in Papua New Guinea will mourn him, close friends like Dame Meg Taylor, um, who have worked so hard um, to carry on uh, his legacy. As Dame Meg um, leaves her role as Secretary General uh, of the Pacific Island Forum, I know that she leaves a legacy of which her dear friend Sir Michael would justly be proud. So his memory, I think, will live on. And whilst Papua New Guinea will continue to face challenges, I am sure that the legacy of Sir Michael Samari will be a guiding light for the years to come. Vale, Sir Michael. I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. Senators.